Now, I'm delighted to be joined by leading feminist Julie Bindle. It's been a big week for feminism and indeed this transgender row continues to fill the newspapers and the column inches after Adam Graham and the decision at the last minute for Nicola Sturgeon not to put him in a woman's prison after well, after all, considering he's a convicted rapist. Now, the latest on this is Nicola Sturgeon now telling the Scotsman some gender reform critics using women's rights are hiding bigotry. Mm. She said that some of these people, yourself included, Julie, mm. I imagine, you're cloaking yourself um, in women's rights to hide your bigotry. You're not just bigotry, bigoted, bigoted, by the way. You may also be a transphobe. Mm -hmm. Quite an extraordinary allegation mm -hmm. to level against a lesbian, but we'll come on to that in a moment. And you might be a racist. That's right. And we are bigots and Nazis. All of a sudden, after in my case and the case of many other feminists that I work with on this issue, after more than four decades of campaigning to end male violence against women and girls, rape, domestic violence, the murder of women and girls, forced marriage, you name it, we've campaigned against it. We are only involved in this struggle, in this war, that we didn't want to start mm. because we don't want men in single sex spaces because they pose a danger. Now, when I say men, I include those men that identify as transgender. They are still men. They still uh, perpetrate sex crimes and other crimes against women and girls, as do non-trans identified men. And so that's why we have legislation and policy which says we can have our own hospital wards, prison wings, uh, refuges, changing rooms, sports facilities. It's not because we ever said all men are rapists, it's because we recognised through credible research all over the world that enough men, a large enough minority of men, do perpetrate these crimes against women and girls, therefore we need our own spaces. So this is not about keeping men, uh, keeping trans women out of women's prisons and the like, it's about keeping men out of women's prisons, and that should include male prison officers. And when you talk about that, obviously the transgender community will say, look, this guy, Adam Graham, he identifies as Isla Bryson. Mm -hmm. um, he has got the right to do that. Obviously, if he was up in Scotland, he would be able to mm -hmm. do that with his new gender Thanks recognition to bill. Thanks to Sturgeon. He'd be able to just simply declare that because he's over mm -hmm. 16. He doesn't need any medical intervention, mm -hmm. no medical confirmation at all. He's able to do that. We now read, and I think you've also looked into this, Julie, that there's another criminal, somebody who has assaulted a 13-year-old girl in the same yes. situation as Adam Graham. What's your response to that case? What kind of world do we live in where convicted rapists and sex offenders are being placed on the female estate when we know that the vast majority of those women in prison are highly vulnerable, whatever their crimes, and most have ended up in prison as a direct or indirect result of men's violence in childhood through to adulthood? Now, I actually would say that there is no space, no place at all for any man, whether they're convicted sex offenders or not, in women's prisons and women-only spaces. And the idea that gender identity somehow trumps sex is nonsense. It's because of men's violence that we have single-sex exemptions, that we have a right to these spaces. And the vast majority of male sex offenders are not ever convicted. They're usually never even arrested. So why would it be safe to have any man in women's prisons? And as I say, I include male prison officers in that. Let's just clarify that point. Obviously, um, Adam Graham has undergone no surgery mm -hmm. or anything. Um, and he is a sex offender. Yes. What about um, a transgender woman who had undergone uh, alignment surgery, um, who had got a, a, a certificate, mm -hmm. who hadn't necessarily committed any crimes against women? Maybe they uh, were in for fraud or something that was mm -hmm. a non-violent offence. How would you feel about that person being placed in a woman's prison? In exactly the same way as I would about a man who had not... Uh, committed any crime, um, who seems like a really nice chap, who decides that he's going to get changed next to a 14, 15 year old girl in a sports facility. It's not because we say that they are rapists or they are sex offenders. It's because we recognise that enough of that minority of men that are pose a danger to women and girls. But also we have to look at the fear that women experience when we see a man who shouldn't be there in a space that's supposed to be designated single sex because of our vulnerability. Hospital wards, prisons and the like. But does post-op make a difference? No, not at all. I think that it's obviously, um, you know, it, it just adds 
you know, fuel to the fire when we're talking about some bloke walking around with his penis visible through his clothing or even, in the case of Karen White, another trans-identified male, his actual penis visible per se on a prison wing. Of course it does. It, it instills even more fear in women. But may, men, including those that identify as transgender, commit acts of sexual violence, every single piece of research, including our government's research has shown, to the same extent, in the same pattern, as do men that don't involve, that, that have not undergone any form of gender reassignment, including those that socially transition. And I think it's an absolute obscenity that we put the so-called rights of men uh, who just identify as women, when we know they're not, every single person listening to this knows they're not women, above the rights and the well-being of women who are already vulnerable but enough. But this is how the dialogue has changed, hasn't it? And I think this is a um, question that Nicola Sturgeon and some of her supporters have sort of failed to answer. Who is it who decides, ultimately, mm. the identity of any given person? Mm -hmm. Because there will be trans people watching this who consider you a turf, yes. who consider you a bigot, as Sturgeon has yes. uh, described you and J.K. Rowling and others, who say, look, if this man identifies as a woman, then you are eroding his human rights, you're eroding his right to be seen equally to womankind. I don't care. Men, trans-identified men already have rights. They have men's rights. I do not care if they're offended. And I also don't care if any man wishes to use a female name, wear a skirt and claim that he is a woman. Let him fill your boots. But he's not. And we know, all women know, that the only reason why we have single sex spaces and sex-based rights in law and policy is because of men's violence. If men stop raping and killing us, if men stop beating us in relationships, stop being a danger, stop posing a danger, uh, we won't care. It doesn't matter. Until that day, then we have to have our own facilities in order to protect in the most vulnerable of us from men's violence. What's your analysis of why Nicola Sturgeon is pushing this so hard? Because we obviously associate her with the independence campaign. This is now proving a massive distraction. Mm -hmm. There's some rhetoric in the newspapers this morning about it might actually be the end of her political tenure. I hope so. I hope so. I think Nicola Sturgeon is a disgrace. I think this is all about political expediency. She is looking um, at getting... Uh, plaudits. She wants to be seen as the kind, um, exclusive person. She wants to be praised by all of those that don't give a damn about women's rights, because, of course, that's really deeply unfashionable. To be a feminist and say men do commit acts of violence and this is wrong is a deeply unattractive and unpopular thing to say. People, it gets their hackles rising. And I've known this for over 40 years of feminism. Nicola Sturgeon is anything but a feminist. She's a betrayer of women, she's a disgrace, and I do hope that this ends her political career and that it serves a warning to all the other posturers that come after her. Well, let's talk about other political posturing because my analysis of you would be that you have always been on the left and yet the left mm -hmm. seems to have been found wanting on this issue. We saw the behaviour towards Rosie Duffield in the House of yes. Commons last week. We've then got this bizarre situation where the likes of Keir Starmer and others can't seem to define whether a woman can or can't have a penis, whether a woman does or doesn't have a cervix. I mean, as a lefty, if I may call you that, Julie, of what's your, your, your uh, analysis of how the left are handling this issue? Well, I do think that we have to separate the Labour Party and its current administration from the left in general. You know, the left does not belong to those misogynistic men who claim that they speak for the left. And the right has let women down drastically and horrendously over the years with taking money away from refuges, um, from not failing to recognise that women have vulnerabilities when it comes to male violence, um, attacking single mothers, taking away benefits that leave women extremely vulnerable. So the right is no friend to women. Mm. The left needs a kick right up their backside. And Rosie Duffield, who's a dear friend of mine, who was a darling of the Labour Party, yes. rightly so, because she spoke publicly about her own domestic abuse situation and standing up to that abuse. She has been treated, I would say, sadistically. And I think that anyone, despite your views on this issue, despite whether you sit on the left or the right, should speak out in, in support of Rosie, because it's the way that she has been treated that has deterred other women on the left that should know better, yes. that should be speaking out fully and publicly in support of Rosie and in support of women's rights. Julie Bindle, thank you very much indeed for joining me this morning. Thank you.